Hey, I'm Chip from The Real Dirt. I'm Jamie from Mother and Clone. Download our episode where we talk about vertical growing, our favorite cannabis strains, and how more women need to be in the cannabis industry. On The Real Dirt at iTunes or TheRealDirt.com. Hey, here we are once again on The Real Dirt. Today's dirt, I have Jamie Madsen. Say, hey, Jamie. Hi. It's a Hi. pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jamie uh, is our first female grower we've had on the podcast. We've tried to get a few. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you're getting an award for this, Jamie. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Feeling um, special. Yeah, you absolutely should feel. There's a plaque or something, a medal maybe. Um, uh, we'll have to talk to the producers after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie is with Mother and Clone. Mother and Clone, they're a cannabis brand focused on genetics and low-dose sublinguals. Mm -hmm. We'd like to dedicate this episode today to uh, Scott Vlack. He is the CFO. Kevin's father passed away last night. Um, and he was a, a major contributor to the organization in, in many ways. And uh, everyone's sad to see him go. Mm-hmm. So uh, back to the bright things of growing. Tell us, tell us about what's going on at Mother and Clone. It sounds like a clone operation, like I, like I said earlier. Yeah, pretty much. We've been working on this warehouse for about seven months, I would say now. All right. Here in Denver? It's just outside Denver, around like Commerce City. Right, right. So it's 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a brand new cannabis brand. Yes. Uh, and it's in, it's in Denver. Yeah, pretty now, much. Many people say that it's too late to get into the market and uh, you could only, you know, make it if you were at the beginning, but you guys are proof that's not true. You can get in the market. Yeah, exactly. Right? You're building out right now. Mm -hmm. I think it definitely helps seeing, I think, other grows and some of the pitfalls that they may have experienced. So coming in late, there are some benefits, I would say. Oh, sure. Like, like mean, what? Like what? Just trying to fix some of the, I guess, hardships that early growers in the Denver industry might have faced. The change in regulations, yeah, right. huge change in regulations. Because right. now it's almost completely set is what's going to happen. Yeah. Right, you know how to build the rooms out, you mm -hmm. know how to uh, build the rooms out for compliance. Yes. Right. The big yeah. issue. The big issue. And compliance, it was rapidly changing in the early days. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a phenomenon I like to call pioneers versus settlers. Ooh, I now, like that. I've been both a pioneer and a settler. Pioneers get slaughtered and settlers <laughs> build on their bones. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, many people went out of business and had problems early in the days or it cost them lots of money, lots of time. You know, they might have had great ideas, but couldn't get it through because of all the changing regulations. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Colorado will be definitely an example to follow for other states in the future, at least a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Colorado's setting the pace for everybody right now yeah. in regulation and how they build it out. And, you know, the the major, the people that have been successful, uh, is sour diesel okay for us today? Here? Yeah, of course. Oh. Smells really good. Smell it, smell it up. Those secondary compounds are being released as I open the jar. Denver and Colorado has become um, mm, uh, a leader mm -hmm. in it all, really. The chagrin of many of my California friends Right now they're booing this website as they listen to it around their <laughs> trim table. Right. <laughs> <laughs> California's the leader. Oh, no, yeah. it's Massachusetts. No, you're right. Right. Everybody wants to be the leader. Everyone wants to. Right. But Colorado really was the first to regulate it and to uh, see large scale grows be developed under regulation and to see uh, businesses develop under regulation. And nobody's had that. Yeah. Let's talk about your background a little bit. How'd you get here? You went to school here, huh? Yeah. So I, I grew up in Illinois and then just fell in love with Colorado at a young age, uh, decided to come out to university here at Colorado State and uh, decided I wanted to study horticulture, got my degree in. Uh, I got a horticultural degree with a concentration in seed science and genetics. And I just feel lucky almost to get some industry experience beforehand. Uh, I was really big into seed science beforehand. And then, so were you were you interested in, in cannabis is it, when you started studying horticulture? Um, uh, just on a like personal level, 
Just on a personal level. Yeah. Right, right. You didn't have some backyard breeding project that you were mm. going to develop over? Okay. Just, no. I did some personal grows, but no no breeding through college. Mostly just studied breeding throughout college. Right. And then uh, did some personal grows. Enjoyed smoking a lot of weed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it wasn't your goal when you went to school for to get a horticultural degree that you were going to end up in the cannabis industry. In cannabis, yeah, not necessarily. It, it was definitely at some point it changed, though, huh? Mm-hmm. Right, right. <laughs> I, yeah, especially as I started uh, developing more of a love for the plant, it was an industry I could see myself uh, <laughs> growing a future in. Yeah, yeah, that's a revelation I like to call. Damn. I can grow this shit. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I had that revelation when I was about 13. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> a little before it, me. As soon as I saw a bag of seeds in it, you know, cause like it was all this anti-drug propaganda and nobody even knew what, you know, weed was. We didn't know it was a flower. We didn't know it was a plant. We're yeah. Like, I guess, marijuana. you know, um, some pot. And uh, we saw, I saw seeds in a bag. Okay. Right. And it wasn't the first bag. It took several bags before we saw seeds in it. Um, mostly because it was just shake or joints or grass clippings, you know. Yep. Some <laughs> nice uh, brickweed. Yeah. And then, yeah. And the, or, or some nice brickweed where it was like the, you just, it was just squares of plant material that we still didn't know were buds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Compressed beyond recognition. So did you have a aha moment over all of this? Uh, I would say it was it was either always like hops or cannabis for me. Oh, right. Probably right around sophomore year. Got really big into craft beer and cannabis in general. And they're kind of related. They're in the same family. Totally. You know? Totally. Same family of entrepreneurs, same family of do-it-yourselfers. Oh, and... And the same family of plants. Yeah. Right, right. Which is awesome. And how'd you get this job with uh, Mother and Clone? How'd that work? It was almost pretty much right after I graduated uh, with my degree, probably last May. And uh, I saw him post on campus and many people weren't really picking up on it. Uh, I didn't know if a lot of students were really big into the cannabis game. And I (laughs) wanted to take every chance I could get. And uh, I feel really lucky. Uh, We vibed really well, uh, me and my employers. And I think that's Really big for a company, especially a new one starting out. All right. We've, we've, we've got continued this continued technical difficulty here on the Real Dirt Podcast. And apparently we don't have a lighter again. I think I might. <laughs> I think I might. <laughs> All right. Yes, I do. Mm, look at that. Mm. It's green. Yeah, I think the man purse should be more uh, prevalent in our society because uh, the guys I know carry more stuff or need more stuff than need uh, more stuff. Uh, women who it's 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 acceptable for them to Harry have small handbags. Now mm-hmm. guys, they have to have like a briefcase or or something. But like if I could just have a little handbag and people not look at me weird, it'd be perfect. Little man bag. Little man bag. Yeah. You know, so just something big enough for like a, a couple of extra large papers, maybe like you know quarter pound of weed. And, quarter you pound. Know, you right, know, just you know, just enough for the day. Just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for saving the day here. Mm, oh, I'm yeah. pocket your lighter here. Uh, we've seen a transition with the growers in Colorado coming from the small scale home grow industry because there was this uh, closely held information on how to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And those are the first waves of growers and developers in yeah. Colorado. And then engineers and HVAC people and architects got involved. And this myth of how to build a room and how to like develop an environment for cannabis kind of went away. Mm -hmm. The original growers, some of them are still around because they were great, but uh, uh, they they weren't able to scale right to to this level. Yeah. Right. And now we're having people like you who are uh, classically trained in horticultural or botany or plant science Mm -hmm. of some manner come into the industry. Do you know any other horticulturalists or Classically trained plant people. Classically trained. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's definitely a, a paradigm shift, I would say, going on, especially like my generation compared to the pioneer growers. Those of us who got slaughtered. Yes. Right. <laughs> well, not not everyone. Right. But. Not everyone. No, no, no. <laughs> the other students I was going to school with in college were all like horticulture majors as well. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily cannabis heavy 
where they may end up in a nursery or a greenhouse, uh, myself and others may lean more heavily towards cannabis. Mm -hmm. I think it just helps a little bit being well-rounded in the whole aspect of the plant universe, if you will, in depth about multiple different species, varieties. Absolutely. Growing. Absolutely. I've, uh, I've been fa fascinated with all things growing and all technology associated with it since I was a little kid. M most cannabis people are, are sole plant growers. They only want to grow cannabis. They only grow cannabis. In the, in the past, that was partly because uh, the cross-contamination from plants and other disease, there was mm -hmm. this information about that. And, oh man, you had to use all your water to grow weed. You couldn't oh, yeah. grow anything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's another big thing is like, I feel like so many of my favorite classes were the uh, pathogen related classes and plant disease, plant nutrition that just on like an everyday level helps, even if you just want to grow like tomatoes in your backyard. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, I think that's a good place to stop. And we're going to come back and we're going to talk about integrated pest management systems, vertical grows, water loss, and irrigation. All right. This is Chip with Real Dirt and Jamie Madsen. I got to get incredible thanks out to Denver Normal. They're an organization that advocates for the rights of every marijuana consumer in the Mile High City, while also creating long-lasting partnerships with local businesses that share our value. Thanks, Denver Normal. It takes people like you to really make the change. And we're back. That's right. Nice little break there. Nice little smoke break. Nice little smoke break. I know we had a smoke break for my smoke break. <laughs> so you guys are just building this new organization, this new this new grow. You're designing this from the from the ground up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, tell us what you do right now. What's going on right now? So right now we are in the build out phase of a new warehouse, and it's mostly uh, myself and our CFO Kevin are uh, just like setting up this really crazy vertical system, vertical irrigation, vertical drainage, vertical lighting. It's supposed to be super sustainable and almost zero water loss, next to none. We're trying to get, being Colorado, we want to be environmentally as friendly as possible. As you should anywhere you are, be environmentally friendly. Yeah, definitely. Right? I'm an environmentalist foremost. So the vertical grows are really interesting to me. They were the a vertical grow was actually the first commercial grow I saw back late nineties, mm -hmm. right? And they were they called them bunk beds at the time, <laughs> right? And they bunk would take a, a a super tall or extra tall shipping container, okay, right, and put two rows of bunk beds down it with an aisle in the middle. Wow! And they okay. lit it with four hundred watt lights, <laughs> right? Uh, it, uh, so you were able to get, I believe, like 40, 400 watt lights wow. in a container. Yeah, one shipping container. In one shipping container, you know, eight and a half by 42 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I'd seen smaller grows, you know, one light, two light, a handful of plants, but never anything quite like that. You yeah. know, and they had a few of these things. They were powered by generators. Jeez. Right. And back then it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Right. And this guy was totally crushing it, you know, pound light. Jeez. Right, killing it, dude. See, really green style, it. right? Uh, um, had been doing it for a number of years. This guy was a pro, you know. He had been doing it thirty years already at the time, so that's what happens. But I've always been fascinated with it. I've seen several incarnations of vertical grows. Oh uh, yeah, it means so many different things to so many people. Let's talk about how you guys are building your vertical grows. Is it on shelves? Is it a system? Like, like how is it going to work? Um, so we have shelving units. We've got. So each flower room consists of four vertical shelving units that are on a rolling system. So they can be like hand moved to the left or the right to space them out. The as positions far as you of the want. shelves can be moved. Mm -hmm. right. And then the lights hang in between two of the rows so that plants are getting light on both sides. Mm -hmm. And then those lights move really slowly back and forth. So it covers like the complete canopy. Mm hmm. In like a really nice smooth motion, so there's like even lighting, always moving back or back and forth. So you have you you're having vertically hung bulbs. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Right, and then in, instead of horizontal bulbs, a bulb above each shelf. Right. Oh, all right. And and what kind of what are you lighting this with? We're using um, LECs, CMH or ceramic oh, yeah. metal halide. Totally. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm a uh, technology skeptic, and the uh, LECs, the CMHs, are, are awesome, awesome lamps. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, great technology, low wattage, mm-hmm. um, awesome, awesome spectrum. Awesome you know, spectrum. And great penetration, really, for canopy, too. Yeah. So you guys are just hanging these exposed vertically and moving them back and forth. Yeah. Right? Oh. Uh, right now, since we're starting at half, it'll be, I think we've got 20 lights in between each row Mm -hmm. and then that'll move to 40 or 80 per room Mm -hmm. yeah moving moving constantly right right. and and you guys are using a light rail system or something to move it or yeah it's like a home built light rail pretty much custom 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 fabricated fabricated (laughs) light moving system yeah man i built tons (laughs) of shit over the years i love building stuff i love it I've, i've had fabricators and machinists and just like Backyard welders work for me and have had, uh, I'll just love it. Like, hey, let's make this. Hey, yeah. let's make this. You know, I'm, I miss it right now. I don't, I don't have one, but. Um, yeah, it's definitely fun. I mean, it was like Legos or for <laughs> mm-hmm. me, like assembling everything, just all the pieces. Right. Let's go through how this is all going to work. You're going to, you're going to take clones. Mm-hmm. And then, and then where do they go from, from, are you going to use aero cloner or, or cubes or yeah, why don't well, you explain the whole thing? So we'll probably start with clones and we're going to start them in cubes. Mm-hmm. Um, we're growing in cocoa, so it'll be a hydro cocoa system. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we're minimizing runoff. So we're aiming for like as little runoff as possible until flush. And then our like whole system is pretty much solidly trying to be built around sustainability. Right, and right. So uh, I think a, a big thing about it was just making sure everything was, I don't know, environmentally friendly friendly. as possible yeah absolutely that's great many people don't even think about that as an end result so you guys had cocoa and pots yeah like small pots sorry yeah we're gonna start from clone root the clone and then we're gonna go to two gallon pots because they're gonna be smaller plants Mm -hmm. and almost it's a really short veg and they're gonna like go straight into flower pretty much on a perpetual two-week harvest oh right right um so uh uh High plant count per square foot, yeah, that type thing. Yeah. Right, awesome. I love to see plants grow like that. I know it hasn't been like a the easiest thing for people to get into in regulation. Mm-hmm. You know, so bigger plants, you know, are easier for people to consistently get yield out of too. But yeah, I like to see small plants. I like small plants. Right, right. We'll have one room. Um, it's not finished yet, but that one room will be dedicated to full full plants. Right, and and how how are you guys irrigating this stuff? So we built this crazy, Kevin and I built this crazy semi-automatic dosing system out of like PVC, awesome. Each harvest group is on its own dosing, Mm -hmm. um, automatic dosing. So we don't have to be there to like mix nutrients as much, which is going to be really nice. Wow, so, so you can have a two and a half, two week harvest time. Yes. Wow, uh, that's a, that's a lot of that's the plan. Uh, okay, keep on talking. Oh yeah, and uh, <laughs> each of the so our system has these controls, and you just flip on which uh, which room, which harvest group you're doing, mm-hmm. and then it doses. We have a I don't know if I an auto grow and like an intellidose to help with that kind of. Oh totally, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I know Auto Grow. Kelly from Auto Grow. Yeah. She's helping you guys out. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly's awesome. She, we'll we've it. worked together for years and years. I'm really excited to get it going. Mm-hmm. See how it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're really cool systems. Yeah. She sold me one in like 1998. Oh, I wow. Think. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Totally. And it's been like, she's a, a leader in that industry. He's been working with it, cool. you know, all those years and knows every single thing about it, how to solve every problem. She, yeah, yeah. It's going to be great working for her. Yeah. I know she's excited about it. I'm excited about it. Oh, great. Yeah. She mentioned she was working with some people over here, but she uh, didn't say who. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this crazy mind bender, like we sat down and had this just brainstorm session of how to do irrigation in this vertical warehouse. And so we came up, we came up with the auto doser and then building the actual frame out of piping polytube for the system, mounting it on the shelves was just crazy. It, right. it was awesome. It was crazy. And I'm excited to see it in action. Are you guys using compensated drippers or? Yeah, well, we have spaghetti or tube coming off the main lines and then we'll have uh, pressure regulated drippers in mm-hmm. each pot. Uh, right at the soil line. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Standard thing. Pretty much. 
Awesome. Yeah, I, I love cocoa, love automatic drip irrigation. You know, people often claim you can't grow weed with uh, automatic drip mm-hmm. irrigation, but I've seen thousands and thousands of pounds grown that way. Oh, yeah. Right. And all our food's grown that way. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, it absolutely can be done and at a high quality, too. Yeah, I think so. So what's going on here? Because okay. you got a sublingual <laughs> brand. Yeah. Right. But you're growing, you're growing weed. So you're going to sell what, what, what What's happening? I think some of our our some of our product is going to be sold as whole flower bud okay. to dispensaries, wholesale to dispensaries, and All then right. some of it will be extracted, uh, which will then be turned into our sublinguals and future products. Oh, right, great, great, yeah. It's it's hard to just do one thing in the industry, right? You got to make money every way you can, right? So. Let's let's talk about the sublinguals since we I just brought oh, it up. Yes, of course. Um, uh, many people don't know what that means. Tell no. us about it. So I like to think of it where there's edibles and then there's sublinguals and where you may take an edible and it could take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to kick in. Mm-hmm. So you're sitting there waiting and then you may overdose it or underdose it and not really get your correct level. Where sublinguals, they kick in within 60 seconds and you can really get an accurate dosing. So people who are new to cannabis, children or elderly or just anyone who's kind of scared Mm -hmm. to test it out, test the waters, uh, they can really start low dose, feel how it feels almost instantly Mm -hmm. and then build up from there. Oh, right. So what's, what is considered a low dose? Uh, I would say 2.5 milligrams. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh. Uh, I often split a five milligram mint with my wife. A mint, right? Yeah. Uh, Two point five might even be even high for people. I, yeah, I, as I gave a new somebody person. a five milligram mint recently, and they lost it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know the f- the first time my brother tried an edible, it was five milligrams, and he it like blew his mind. And right. I was like, "That's cute. It's That's cute." Like, That's cute. <laughs> now, some people it just affects differently. I mean, yeah. I, I can smoke weed all day. When I can, and uh, uh, when life allows me, uh, <laughs> uh, but man, I, it's taking a eat edibles like affect me. You yeah, know? I ate a ten milligram marshmallow yesterday. Uh, puff, a puff. ten milligram puff, <laughs> I believe they called it. And uh, yeah, I'm a little slow today because of it. I don't know <laughs> if you can hear it, but uh, I find that yeah, they definitely do that. Mm-hmm. Is it a technology? Is it a consumable? Like, do you? Like, what is it? So right now we're starting with a spray. So it'll go under the tongue and then Mm -hmm. dissolve down, hold it there for like a little bit. All right. Slightly different than a tincture where like a tincture may um, still absorb in the GI tract, Mm -hmm. still inedible. Right, 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 right. Yeah, cool. Well, you know, that's a perfect place to uh, have another break. This is Real Dirt, Chip. I'm here with Jamie Madsen from Mother and Clone. We'll be right back. These new episodes are made possible through some really awesome partnerships. We want to form long-term relationships with other entities who have similar goals. Thanks to Grower Soil, a line of soil and nutrients manufactured and developed right here in Colorado. Also, thanks to Cultivate Colorado with two stores in the Denver metropolitan area. Cultivate has one of the largest selections of indoor to horticultural equipment in the known universe. So stop by if you have any growing needs. Grow your dreams, cultivate your legend. And we're back. Wow, that was an exciting break. <laughs> Did you have me bring any of this product? me to sample to see if it was if it actually works oh man i'm sorry i didn't i'll drop some off i'll drop some off (laughs) i'm just jiving you but hysterical so all right so i still don't quite understand what's going on here with your Mm -hmm. with the sublingual thc bonds to 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 fat and oils yes right so like when normally when i have an edible it might take me 10 minutes or it might take an hour for it to affect me. Right. Right. So so what's the difference between the sublingual? Okay. So uh, we basically developed a proprietary formula where the THC instead bonds to water instead of a lipid and uh, it absorbs differently 
within 60 seconds then uh, under right, the tongue. Because right, your body absorbs water immediately. Yeah. Oh, well, well, cool. I definitely want to try this now that I, that I understand this more. Um, and uh, it's just a spray. So like you, you, you spray it once and that's a dose. Yes. And each spray right now is 2.5 milligrams. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in the future we'll maybe mess with different doses or different product lines. And is this like an inhaler spray or like a... Uh, just like a... little squirt? Like a little squirt spray. All right. All right. Yeah. Just like a throat spray. Throat spray. <laughs> right. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Part of your brand, you say you're you're focused on genetics. Let's let's talk about how you guys are going to uh, what your genetic plan is here. How how I got into it? Well, just like what what's your genetic plan for mother and clone? We have a whole floor dedicated to um, genetics right now, which is not super common, just with the whole scare of spreading pollen throughout the whole facility. But uh, I think we have a very isolated room to keep it clean, and there's a clean room entering. So we can have genetic breeding and testing, trying stuff out on site. So it'll just, it'll be nice to have it there and ready and can like create new things. Right. Awesome. So it's, you, you guys are making seed. Yes. Cross pollinating plants. Mm -hmm. And then in your vertical grow, are you going to grow the seed? Are you going from clone there? We're going to mostly go from clone. All right. Um, new, new genetics will start from seed, outsource seed, locally, oh, okay. but. Sure. So you you got you got you got anything you're like looking for any goals like looking you gotta... for so many I love I love some of the old land races uh, just for breeding purposes like big fan of Afghani a bunch of the Kushes even just some of the older like what I remember in high school strains like White Widow the White or Train Wreck I think would be awesome to just I don't know, kind of bring back into the mix with some different genetics yeah yeah absolutely messing Great. with like Terpene profiles, like a big one for me, kind of mm -hmm. getting good flavor, high, high terpene content. Sure. Yeah. And uh, becoming a focus for extraction too. Oh yeah. Right. For, for the dabbables. The dabbables. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we need more genetics for sure. There needs to be more genetic research in Colorado. It is difficult to like get them in here, but mm -hmm. it can be done. People are scared of cross pollinating their product. Oh and, yeah. Big worry. You know, it's a big worry. And like, yeah, you just got to like take a little care, right? Mm -hmm. I've um, I've been into a lot of big grows where they've they've had some breeding project and it doesn't take much room, yeah. right? You can do it in, you know, a, a small area really. And yeah, ours is really small. Right, small. right. I mean, like one and two lights or I've even seen people do it under like fluorescent lights mm -hmm. as part of it, right? You yeah. know, plant out a bunch of seeds, sex them under fluorescent lights, you know, catalog all the clones and then like, you know, make some initial selections. Yeah. Right. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely something we need to do more of and focus more of. And mm -hmm. I don't, currently there's just like this name game that goes on. Oh my gosh. Big name right? game. Big name game. And it doesn't really mean anything right to, to people that want to know more about the plant or want to know more about like what the, the, yeah the history of the origins of that, you know, nugget might be. That nugget. That nugget. <laughs> you got a favorite weed? Oh, I'm a big, big White Widow fan. All and right. the white, uh, big Indica fan, mm -hmm. mostly. But I like yeah. to mix it up. Yeah, totally, yeah. What about you? Yeah, you yeah. know, Sour Diesel is absolutely my favorite, hands down. Um, I like, I do like other stuff, though. I, I like... Uh, the, the the earthy flavor of uh, the bubba mm -hmm. and the bubba crosses. Um, I like that uh, debilitating Kim Dog high and that greasy feel yes. that those nuggets get. The Kim Love Dog, that. right? We've been smoking a bunch of uh, old family purple. It's called from Ooh. CSI. They're out of uh, Humboldt. Uh, cool. Uh, and it's Urkel Triangle Cross. Nice, right? So it, it tastes of Urkel. Sounds really good. Right? Yeah, it's it's good. Um, it's hard for me to say I have a favorite, right? I, it's definitely uh, different, different strains, um, you know, uh, as opposed to like indica, the whole indica sativa yeah, thing. I feel that, right? Uh, which is how we need to be talking about this, this, and how the bud tenders need to be talking about it. Is it strain oriented, mm -hmm. not like this fictitious indica, indica sativa conversation that you know people want to have? Right. You, 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 you're, I mean, you come from a plant background, you, you, you go into different places and see this type of conversation going on. 
Uh, among the bud tenders? Mm-hmm. Or just the growers in general? Oh, definitely among growers. Mm-hmm. Uh, some some bud tenders who are like really into it, I think. Right, right. I mean, most are. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's what m- it's unfortunately how most people are exposed to the plant is with that indica sativa con- conversation. Yeah. But it just doesn't really say much. Yeah, you go to one place and a sativa is an OG Kush, and you go to the next place and it's an indica. Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, on and on and on and on. Or like, on. yeah, sativa dominant hybrid that feels like an indica. I've gotten that one before. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you? <laughs> okay. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, no, it's it's hard for me to not say it sometimes. But, um, you know, uh, the butt tendon definitely needs something. There needs to be more education in that one. There's some good education, but mostly those guys are just thrown in there. And they're like, here's oh, yeah. a list of stuff. Well, I know that we're definitely... I think planning on supplying something with our oh, good suppliers education. about sublinguals at least. Right. To just right. reinforce that it's it's not an edible. It's different. Yeah. 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 Um yeah, education's actually is totally the key. Um uh yeah, I'm, I'm excited about your vertical grow. I wanna come check it out. Oh yeah. Uh, We'd love to have you. Yeah, it's uh when are you when are you gonna be online? I think within the next month. We should be within the next month. Oh, all right. And you you've already got Cannabis growing in the facility? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. So you're just, just waiting on. Yeah. Just waiting on stuff. So, you know, I, we we, we kind of talked about hops a little bit and how like it was really similar to to cannabis. Oh, yeah. Um, and, that, and at some point you were trying to decide which, which way you wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Right. And you worked on a hops breeding operation uh, oh, yeah. in, in between graduating college and uh, coming to work for Mother and Clone. What is it that's, because I look at hops and I see these 20 foot annual plants, Yeah. right? I'm like, well, that's not like weed, you know, right? Oh, yeah. Could you maybe give me a, give me why they're, why they're, they're the like same, weed. why they're like each other? Yeah, of course. Um, they're, well, one, they're in the same plant family, Cannabaceae, and uh, they have lupulin glands inside the hops. Uh, and that's kind of what I like to equate to cannabis as THC or terpenes. Some of the same terpenes in cannabis are found in hops, and that's like what flavors the beer. So like pinene, alpha pinene is in hops. It's also in cannabis. And um, it was really interesting working on the farms because you'd go down the rows, you'd split open a hop and you'd smell it. And then almost some of them were like dank smelling, like really dank. And I was just like, this is so much, so much similar to weed and Mm -hmm. And the leaf shape is a little bit similar. I just, it's cool to see how two plants in the same family can be different, but the same. Yeah, right. Different effects, but. And and I said hops was an annual earlier, but that's not true. No, it's a perennial. It's a perennial (laughs) and cannabis is an annual. Yeah. Right. Uh, So you just, you you plant hops the first year, it grows for the first year and it doesn't, mostly doesn't produce or historically it doesn't produce. Right. And then the the following years it starts to produce. It gets a little more hardy. Right. And then I'll start winding up. Right, right. Where weed has a a specific life period. Yeah. It'll one plant and then harvest. One plant, harvest, die, plant it again. Yeah. Right. Unless seeds from that plant came off of it and hit the ground, there's not going to be another weed plant that grows in that spot. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love hops. I love the way it smells. I, I, I like to see how they dry it. You know, they oh, dry it a bit differently. It's so, um, it's neat. I can envision weed on a mash scale drying like that. Right. Of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does have the buds, you know, do kind of resemble cannabis buds. Yeah. Right. When you look at it. Definitely. Right. It has that, it has that, that feel and you call that the the, the lupin lupulin lupulin yeah lupulin. and when you like crack them open they're just like little yellow crystals almost mm-hmm. like right at the center mm-hmm. it's cool looking yeah cool man so there i'm gonna i'm gonna i've heard of these hop fields in western colorado oh i don't know I where know. is that uh, uh on the western slope cool right uh uh, there's lots of lots of agriculture is going on over there, but mm-hmm. uh, I've been wanting to go see it, but I, I haven't figured out where it is yet. That would be pretty. So if you know, let us know. Realdirt.com, right? Invite me over. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie might want to go too. Yeah, definitely. Right. You know, I always ask my my guests like what like a pain they've overcome or a problem they've had. We kind of talked about it a, a, immediately. Let let let's talk about this male dominated industry. Yes. I'll get it out there. Oh. 
Um, just agriculture in general, I found even when I had my small uh, time on, on the hops with the hops breeding company, uh, it just agriculture seems to be a male dominated industry. And I would like to see a heavier female presence. Not that it's a bad thing that there are so many males, just it would it would be nice to have some fellow female support. Right. There there are women involved in like in in harvest or farm work. Yes. You're right. You see you do see that mm-hmm. for sure, but but not the uh the growers. Right. Right. They're usually not women. Correct. Right. Yeah, it's been a big problem in, in the weed industry as well, the cannabis industry as well, for sure. My wife, uh, she's also a cannabis enthusiast and we go to cannabis stuff all the time and it's yeah. just it's it's often just dudes. Mm-hmm. Right. It is changing. It right? is changing. It is changing 100 percent. Um, and I'm not sure why that was in the past. I think, uh, you know, maybe women are a little bit more conservative about going to jail and dudes. Mm-hmm. Right. They're like, I'm not going to get busted. Yeah. Right. Or something, you know, in the private market industry days. Mm-hmm. But now that it's legal industry. Right. Uh, there there should be more women involved. Definitely. Right. We've tried to get several women on the on the podcast and, you, and you're our first. I mentioned that. Yes. Right. Well, I was listening to him and I'm like, where are my females? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally, <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, we've we've tried to get a few on. Um, uh, You're the first. Cool. Not the last. Not the last. Yeah, not the last. Absolutely not. Because it, it's it's this female plant. It yeah. has this incredible female industry in, energy. Right. Right. But all the names are masculine names. Mm-hmm. Almost all the names are masculine names, right? Right. Uh, or like these power names. And, really power names. Right. Uh, and what, what do you, I mean, you got anything to say about that? What do you think that is? I don't know. Uh, there's a whole like world for me around the naming of cannabis strains that I kind of want to veer away from. Mm-hmm. We talked about that flavor game a little bit. Yeah. Right, right, right. Or just a lot of. How could you see it? If you could name it. I could name it. If you could name them, how would you name them? Ooh, uh, just uh, just a little bit more refined, a little mm-hmm. classier maybe. Mm, okay, okay, okay. Not, not so... Um, not Death Star? No, or like no... Right, green Crack? Candy yeah. references, <laughs> not... No. Okay, all right. Candy Kush? <laughs> no. Right. I do, I do like the Kush in the name just because it throws to its heritage, which I'm about... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I feel the same way. Is like you, you in the name, you want to be able to have like something to call it, but it has to refer back to some sort of history, right? Right. I I, I do like when they take hybrids of one another and they just mix that the the hybrid the name. names yeah. together. That makes right? sense. It to totally me. makes sense. Right. Totally makes sense. Uh, but just to like make up a name, no. yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> uh. Buddy of mine, Stacy, he owns Harvest House up in Netherlands, mm-hmm. and he says on the marketing side though that the, that he just makes up can can make up a name for a specific batch because you know it, it has a certain like smell or whatever. Yeah, and he he just like sells it heavily that way. Okay, right now he's he he he's always planting seeds and has new stuff coming in. Right, mm-hmm. but uh. Yeah, it's interesting that the public they won't they don't have this education about it, so yeah. they don't care, or it even doesn't sell as good. Yeah, right. They rather have like blueberry, you know. Yeah. Right. Cake. Then, yeah, blueberry cake. There you go. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great, actually. <laughs> hey, do you have any blueberry? It cake? does sound good. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, years ago we had this great strain that tasted of vanilla and blueberries. It was mm. called Blue Lake Cake. That sounds good. Yeah, totally. Really From Blue Lake, California. I know um, I super love those like like grapefruit diesel on a plant just smells like super grapefruit, super citrus, mm-hmm. like punch. Yeah, yeah, you get that 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 like uh, the the fuel smell of the train wreck to open up. <laughs> so good. Your sensory glands, and then you get this, <laughs> the citrus from the grapefruit. Yeah, I can totally see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, terpene combination. So where where's it all going? What's what's the future of our industry here? The future of our industry in Colorado, or in generally in general. with with you, with 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 Mother and Clone, with you Ooh. know Denver, like you know what do you, what do you what do you can you predict something? Can you say something predict about something. what's going to happen? What's happening? Oh, I feel like it at some point is going to be somewhere regulated along the lines of tobacco. If it goes really wide scale, there's going to be have some sort of uh, like federal regulation mm. around it. I don't know. Yeah, 
Yeah, totally. They, they when they as soon as they federally lay, federally regulate it, you think it's going to go the way of tobacco. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Is that going to change the growing or how we consume it? Or I mean, I would hope not. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I hope. I hope it doesn't change too much. Like, do you see the? Saying that, do you, what do you see the future of the indoor industry? Indoor industry. I mean, you guys are doing vertical grows because yeah. obviously you're like, oh, we got to like reduce square footage and reduce wattage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, so. Because, um, you know, what? I don't know how they regulate tobacco now, but it used to be that you could only get a few acres. Mm-hmm. Right. And it was tightly controlled. Outdoor. You know, outdoor. I could right? see that being similar outdoor. Mm-hmm. I know we were, we we're partnered with a eight acre outdoor grow up in uh, the mountains and so it'd be it'd be interesting to see like what the future holds and in, in regards to how many acres people are allowed to have if we're producing at mass scale outdoor mm, yeah <laughs> <laughs> two million acres <laughs> oh yeah here it comes i want to see it mm-hmm. i'm looking forward to it Hey, uh, it's been great talking to you, Jamie. Yes. I really appreciate your time. You too. It's been uh, uh, an interesting conversation. Look forward to having you maybe back, having me over at your place and checking out your grow. I'm interested in seeing these LEC vertical grow. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's The Real Dirt with Chip Baker and Jamie Madison. Mm-hmm.